Good evening, everyone. I am Pastor, I'm Pastor Dave Leistico from Emmanuel on North Side of La Crosse, and it's a pleasure to be able to worship with you this evening. Uh, we'll begin our service with the first hymn, number 102, Enslaved by Sin and Bound in Chains. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done, and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. All too often, when my heart longs for peace and my soul yearns for joy, I turn to everything but you to find fulfillment. I have often ignored you and even despised you, my one and only Savior, by my self-centered and sinful thoughts, words, and actions. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. It is great mercy. God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. 
We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word. And receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated and we'll continue with the psalm, Psalm 143. O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Here now with attentive hearts, the portion of our Lord's Passion History, recorded this evening in Luke chapter 23, beginning at the first verse, we read of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? 
I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty, therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. This is the word of God. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We'll continue with our next hymn, 120, What Wondrous Love Is This? love is this O oh, my soul O oh, my soul what wondrous love is this O oh, my soul what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul for my soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul when i was sinking down sinking down sinking down when i was sinking down sinking down when i was sinking righteous crown Christ laid aside his crown for my soul for my soul Christ laid aside his crown for my soul to God and to the Lamb I will sing I will sing to God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb Who oh, is the great I Am While millions join the theme I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing his love for me. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God for us this evening is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, reading verses 3 to 9. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth? I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, 
then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. This is our text in the word of God. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ who worship the great I am, Jesus, the almighty God, our Savior, our good shepherd. If you think over the stories recorded about Jesus in the Gospels, think about how many times he told people to not reveal his identity or how many times he purposefully hid his identity. For example, think of the woman at Jacob's well. Jesus had a a lengthy conversation with that woman without ever really explaining who he was until finally she made a comment about how when the Messiah comes, then all our questions will be answered. And it was only at that point, kind of late in the conversation, when Jesus revealed, well, the one speaking to you is the Messiah. Or think of the miracles that Jesus did. And after he had performed a miracle for someone, a healing, for example, he told the individual, don't tell anyone. Hush, hush, keep it quiet. Keep it to yourself. They often didn't listen to him. But he told them to keep it quiet. Or even the disciples. There were times when Jesus told them, don't tell anyone who I am. Keep it to yourself. But on this night, as we come to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is about to be arrested, about to go forward in his suffering and death, no longer is there a hush-hush. No longer does Jesus keep it quiet. Instead, he boldly and two times says, I am he. I am Jesus. I am the one you're looking for. Those are our three words of truth for tonight. I am he. But what truth? When we look at what Jesus says and does here, we see three truths really about Jesus. First of all, that he is the mighty God. I am the mighty God, he says. I am a humble servant for you. And I am a faithful shepherd who holds you in my hand. Think about what it must have been like that night for Jesus. He's in the garden and it was quiet for one thing. No one made any sounds except Jesus as he groaned in agony in his prayer to the Heavenly Father. That was a silent, quiet sound as he shed those drops of sweat that were like great drops of blood. In fact, it was so quiet that the disciples who were supposed to be standing watch with him fell asleep. Not only was it quiet in the garden, but when the troop came to arrest Jesus, he had to go and wake the disciples up. It was quiet, but it was also dark. The troops came from the temple grounds. They made their way down the eastern slope from the temple down to the brook Kidron that was running with water this time of year in the spring. In the dark. That word Kidron Kidron means dark. They crossed the dark waters and they made their way up the other side, up the hill, the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane. In the dark, looking for Jesus, we're told that they came They came with torches and weapons. They were looking for trouble. The group was made up of guards from the temple, Levites who worked in the temple to keep order with the crowds, especially at this time with the big Passover feast on the way. There were many people in the city, many people in the temple, and so there was a need for oversight. But probably not just people from the Sanhedrin, just from the temple. There were probably also Roman soldiers in this group. The Roman fortress of Antonia stood at the northwest corner of the Temple Mount. People 
from the fortress could look down on the, on the Jews as they were at work in the temple there. And that way they could see if any trouble was brewing, they could quickly dispatch some soldiers to put things right. So this group comes. They come in the dark. They come at the order of the Sanhedrin, probably also at orders from Pontius Pilate. They come looking for someone who had the potential to start a riot, they were told. They needed to arrest him. If they would have come during the day, there probably would have been a riot. The people favored Jesus at this point. But they came at night. They came in the dark, with dark purposes. As Jesus said, this is your hour when darkness reigns. They came under the cover of night led by Judas. When Jesus meets them, he gets up from his prayer, he wakes up the disciples, and he comes to meet them. And we're told here that he knew all that was going to happen to him. John kind of understates things here when he says that knowing all that was going to happen to him, he went out and asked them, who is it you want? This is more than just kind of a feeling. Jesus may be reading the, the signs on the wall oh no, here's a bunch of soldiers coming to arrest me. I must be in trouble. No. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He looked into these men's faces and he knew them. He knew their names. He knew their parents, their grandparents. He even knew their great-grandparents. He could trace their ancestors, the Jewish ones, all the way back to Abraham. He could trace the Roman soldiers' ancestry all the way back to Noah. And not only did he know why they had came, he also knew how they got there. Whether they were from Judea or Galilee, whether they were from Greece or from Rome or from Spain, from Gaul. He knew the stories of all of their lives, of each and every one of them. And that's because he is their creator. He is the one who formed them. They are his handiwork. And this handiwork of the almighty, all-knowing God had now come to arrest him, to abuse him, to flog him, to beat him, mock him, to nail him to a cross and ultimately kill him. And so when John says, knowing all that was about to happen to him, it's certainly an understatement. But what it shows us is that when Jesus says, I am he, the first truth is, I am he who is the almighty God. Those three little words, I am he, are a reference also to that name of God. I am, the great I am, the God of Mount Sinai, Jehovah. And when Jesus uttered that, those words, those three words, what was the effect We're told it knocked all the soldiers to the ground. It didn't just make them take a step back as if Jesus, they were giving Jesus some extra space. No. They were violently knocked down. They were knocked on their backsides. They were knocked flat to the ground by Jesus' words, I am he. The group may be numbered as many as 150. Jesus knocked them all flat with three little words. His almighty power was on display. So we dare never think that the things that happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and afterwards were things that were outside of Jesus' control. All of it was the work, the plan of the almighty God. And he did it. He allowed himself, he permitted himself to be taken Because not only is he the almighty God, when he says, I am, he is also saying, I am a humble servant. You would think that that troop of soldiers, as they're picking themselves up off of the ground, had to kind of be thinking to themselves, maybe we need to be careful here, but they were driven. They were under orders, especially the Roman soldiers. They always obeyed orders. And so they had to apprehend Jesus. But you can imagine that the first time they ask, 
for Jesus of Nazareth. It was more of a demand. The second time, when Jesus says, who is it you want, they maybe had a little less force in their demand. Jesus allowed himself to be taken captive by sinners. He was following his plan. In his wisdom, in his knowledge as God, there had to be many plans that God could have followed here, but Jesus had prayed to the Father. He said, your will be done, not mine. And so Jesus was on track to follow the plan that they had decided on, he and the Father. He would selflessly give himself for us. But this idea of selflessness, humble service is, is kind of foreign to us because most of the time we act out of self-interest. We like to put ourselves first. Sometimes, of course, we have to do that. But most of the time we do it simply because it's to our best advantage. Even though we know that such selfishness, such self-interest often makes problems in our relationships, whether it's with our relationship with God or our relationship with other people. Judas is an example here, a shining example of that kind of selfish motivation. Pride personified. And he stands as a warning to us. We need to think of him when we think of how great pillars we might be, that we could never turn our backs on Jesus. Judas did. We need to look deep into Judas' eyes and see just how powerful sin is, what it can do to us, how it can reach out and take control of us and drag us away. It can destroy us. As Paul warns us, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Soldiers came. The guards came, and they had their reasons. They came armed for resistance, for trouble. Swords and clubs were told. After all, who wouldn't resist? What person wouldn't say, you're not going to take me without a fight? We see that attitude on the part of Peter, don't we? Of course, he had kind of a chip on his shoulder. He had to kind of make up for his mistake earlier. He had been bragging before they left the upper room. He had been bragging, I'll go to prison. I'll even die with you, Jesus. But then when Jesus had asked them to watch for an, only an hour, what did Peter do? He fell asleep. So he had to make good. He had to save face. He had to improve his reputation, polish his image. And what does he do when the soldiers come? He's quick. He whips out his sword and he strikes off Malchus' ear. In contrast to that, though, we have Jesus. Put up your sword, Jesus says. Jesus stood there calmly in contrast. Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I am he. Twice. I am he. He didn't want there to be any mistake and identification. He didn't want them to take someone else in the confusion and in the darkness. Instead, Jesus boldly steps forward. I'm the one you're looking for. I am he. None of the disciples would be hauled off while Jesus snuck away in the dark as he had done when he escaped crowds who tried to capture him earlier. Now was the time for him to give up his life. His time had come to fulfill the plan. And so he says, I am he. He invites Judas. You betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Clearly identify me because I know that it's my time. And so Judas kissed Jesus. The soldiers could be absolutely sure who it was they were supposed to arrest. And Jesus wanted to make it that way. This is why Jesus came. As he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He came to humble himself and become obedient even to death on the cross. And that's what he did. I am he. I am the humble servant. And as that servant, he shows his great, great love for his people. He shows his great, great love 
Because he says, if you are looking for me, then let these men go. Earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus had declared, I am the good shepherd. And now, on this night, he is that good shepherd keeping watch over his flock by night. That's why he says, let these men go. Think about it. 150 men, maybe, there to capture and arrest Jesus. But who's giving the orders? Jesus. Let these men go, and they let them go. This is the good shepherd at work. He was caring for his disciples, their physical safety, but even more so, their spiritual safety. He saw his death coming. He saw what that crucifixion, the great trial, the sadness, the despair it would bring to his disciples. And so he knew that if they also were to see the mocking and the scourging and all the other things that were to happen, that might be too much for their faith. And so he would, he would spare them that. He would go on alone, as had indeed been prophesied that the Messiah would suffer alone. Defiant sinners would strike the shepherd and the sheep, the disciples would be scattered. And this was part of Jesus' plan so that none of them would be lost. It was for their best for them to go and they were allowed to go. Jesus said, none of those you gave me would be lost. But you might be thinking, well, what about Judas? Wasn't he lost? But even Judas was one that Jesus pursued to the very end with his love as the good shepherd. He kept going after Judas. He pleaded for Judas' kiss, but that was a reminder. Judas, think about what you're doing. And then when Jesus declares, I am he, and they're all knocked to the ground, Judas is knocked to the ground too. Judas, think about what it is you are doing. But then when they get back up, what does Judas do? He doesn't come over to Jesus. He doesn't sense repentance. Instead, he turns and runs away with those who are Jesus' enemies, runs into eternal death. And so even Jesus didn't lose Judas, but Judas ran away from Jesus. Jesus is indeed the good shepherd, the faithful shepherd, and he's the one who protects you and me. When we feel the weight of our sins, when we turn to Jesus in repentance, cling to him by faith, we know that he's there to forgive us. He is the one who protects you with his mighty power. He is the one who laid down his life for you, who is one of his sheep, and as he said, no one can rip us out of his hand. No one can rip us out of the Father's hand. You are his. And he will not lose you. And that's our great hope. That's our, our great comfort. But it's not ours because of who we are. It's not ours because of how strong we are or how committed to Jesus we are. Or how solid we think our faith might be. Instead, without Jesus, we have nothing. It all depends on him. We have great hope. We have that great comfort because of who Jesus is. Not because of who we are. And who is he? He says here, I am he. He is the almighty God who humbled himself and became a servant in order to redeem you, to buy you back. And now, as your faithful shepherd, he continues to hold you in your hand, guiding you, and protecting you on all the way until you reach eternal life through him. Amen. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we will gather the offering.
Please stand for prayer. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, keep our eyes fixed on you who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before you took on the cross and its shame for us. Help us to always believe and trust in you as the great I am, the true God who became one of us, who became a servant, giving your life to buy us back from sin and who continues to care for us as our good shepherd. Strengthen us in this faith and during this Lenten season, increase our appreciation and love for you, for all that you have done. We also offer a prayer on behalf of Sandy Hunter, who is hospitalized at Mayo Clinic in the critical care unit. We ask that you would be with her and grant her strength and health, guide those who have her care, that the work that they may do will be successful. According to your will, grant her healing and especially strengthen her in her faith in you as Savior, and in your help and strength in all things. We ask these things for your sake, and also join to pray your prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close our service with hymn 103, Glory Be to Jesus.
Uh, thank, you, thank you for letting me lead you in worship. It is a pleasure to be with you tonight and share the word of God with you. And uh, blessings on your way home tonight and uh, on the days and weeks ahead as you continue our Lenten journey. The peace of God be with us all.